now that we introduced the concept of tensors and saw a few linear algebra tricks to make our code run faster, let's apply these concepts to the perceptron we implemented in Unit 1. So most of the code will be very similar to the code we used in Unit 1, so I'm skipping over some of the details here, such as the installation of the libraries. The only additional library here we have to install is PyTorch, and here I recommend actually installing PyTorch using pip, because the pip packages for PyTorch are usually a little bit more up to date. So after installing PyTorch, the rest will be very similar to before. So we again load our simple toy dataset that has two features and one label column. Then we assign the features in the label column to the corresponding variables x train and y train. What's new here though is that we are now using the from numpy function to convert these numpy arrays into PyTorch tensors. So now we can see xtrain is actually a numpy tensor. It is very common in deep learning to use float 32-bit tensors because they are more computationally efficient. They are smaller and they fit better into uh, GPU memory if we have large data sets. It's not necessary at this point, but it's actually a good practice to convert float arrays from 64-bit to 32-bits when we work with PyTorch. The remaining code though in this section is exactly the same as in unit 1. Also, just as a quick recap, let's visualize our data set here. So again, we can see it's a very simple data set consisting of two classes, class 0 and class 1. Next, let's get to the interesting part and implement the perceptron using tensors. For reference here, I have the old perceptron from unit 1, and we are now going to modify this old perceptron and make it compatible with PyTorch tensors. So let's copy and paste this code and then make these modifications. So the first modification we make is we replace this list comprehension in Python here with a torch zeros function. And this one will initialize a tensor consisting of zeros. In fact, this will be a vector of zeros where the number of zeros is the same as the number of features. We can then do the same thing here and initialize bias using a torch tensor. Next, as we learned in the previous videos, we can replace this inefficient for loop here with a dot product. So let's do that. So for that, we use torch dot dot, so we can compute the weighted sum as follows. There's only a little modification we have to make here at this point, where we replace the return class label also with a tensor. And finally, there is one more for loop which we can make more efficient, and this is because PyTorch supports broadcasting, as we discussed in a previous video. So we can also now replace this for loop here with a broadcasting operation. These are all the modifications we have to make to our perceptron for now to convert this into a tensor compatible format. So in fact, we can use the same code from unit 1 that we used before to evaluate the results. So here we have the accuracy function from unit 1 to compute the accuracy of our perceptron. Okay. So let's change the name also from old perceptron to just perceptron. Now that we converted our perceptron from plain Python to using tensors, we can actually reuse the same code we used in unit 1 to uh, run the perceptron, train it, and evaluate it. Let's see how that goes. So everything we had in unit 1 should still work, so we can execute the perceptron just like we did before. We don't have any line of code that we have to change. And as we can see, the perceptron still learns and learns to classify the training dataset correctly. So here in this video, we learned how we can use PyTorch tensors to upgrade our perceptron implementation. However, in this video, we just barely scratched the surface when it comes to PyTorch. Tensors are only one little part of PyTorch. In the upcoming units, we will take a look at the more advanced functions of PyTorch and work towards implementing deep neural networks. Mm -hmm.